Hideo Kojima's spy action series Metal Gear Solid is well known for its detailed, if fantastic, depictions of weapons and warfare. But what some fans don't realize is that, while creator and director Hideo Kojima may not be a complete pacifist, his games often take a pacifist or at least anti-war tone. We are not responsible to judge an enemy. It was waiting for someone to kill me. In this brief video essay, we'll look at each game in turn to see how this theme of pacifism has over the years found ironic expression, both in terms of story and gameplay, throughout this military action series. In 1987's Metal Gear for the MSX2 was commissioned by Konami as a knockoff of a popular arcade game at the time by Capcom, Commando. But then rookie Hideo Kojima had other plans. Instead of a typical run and gun scenario, which was technically impossible on the dated MSX hardware anyway, Kojima, drawing inspiration from one of his favorite films, The Great Escape, envisioned a game themed not around endless killing, but avoiding being killed yourself, all while escaping from the enemy. This game idea, called Intruder, was rejected. So Kojima worked back in more military action, but with some interesting provisos. The gameplay would require you to use force only when necessary. Weapons and ammo had to be found if you wanted to stay alive, and remained few and far between. There would be an escape sequence, and in the end, the story would subvert the stereotype of good versus bad. And lastly, and most importantly, the whole game would be themed around preventing terrorists from obtaining a nuclear weapon of mass destruction. Metal Gear 87 would establish a familiar pattern. Instead of just fighting an enemy, you were tasked with neutralizing a threat a threat that first you had to learn about. You'd have to make contact with an intel source who'd reveal the horrible truth about a monstrous new weapon. Then, on the basis of their intel, you'd have to make contact with the creator of said monstrosity, also held prisoner. And only then could you gain the information necessary to face down the final threat. Metal Gear 87 would first introduce a crucial subject for the series and its pacifism, science. Can science really fulfill peaceful purposes? Are scientists shackled to their rulers, forced, whether they realize it or not, to become pawns in their wider political and military game? Ever since the Manhattan Project and the development of modern petroleum engineering, technicians and civilian specialists have more and more become as, if not more, important to military and political elites than soldiers. Are these scientists keeping the peace, or are they waging the war? This question, and the subject of scientific exploitation in general, would recur for this series again and again. Even in the first Metal Gear, there was some form of non-lethal attack. You could punch as well as shoot, quietly without the need of finding a suppressor. Metal Gear figured out characters are often more interesting when they're left alive. Even the bosses in the game, in a mechanic set to return by the Phantom Pain, could be avoided or returned to later with better weapons. The player overall had to gradually piece together where to go and what secret they had to do. Metal Gear was more about solving the game as a puzzle, with fighting merely as an obstacle to your progress, not as the main goal or objective. You played around the violence. You didn't level up to become stronger, but gained class stars to carry more rations and bullets. These you got not by defeating enemies, but rescuing POWs. Killing one could lose you stars, too. Similar features as these would be implemented as the heroism slash demon points in The Phantom Pain, and even as Sam's stars in Death Stranding. However, and this is important, in Metal Gear, sometimes you have to fight just to survive. Healing rations are often only obtainable in a pinch by silently taking out a guard. The risk-reward calculus requires there sometimes be cases when violence is in your best interest. The point is that Metal Gear wasn't about convincing the player never to fight. It was about teaching the idea of situational necessity, of fighting only when necessary, of 
fighting in a game as a choice with a real weight, a cost. Even if there were limits, the ration drops weren't random so certain enemies or areas could be somewhat farmed, for example. It was the start of something new, something that by the next game, Kojima's team would be calling Tactical Espionage. The 1990s Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, meanwhile, took the theme of pacifism and peace even further, complicating things. In this game, developed just before the real Cold War's end, a near future is portrayed where Peace Day has finally come, where for most people the specter of all-out nuclear annihilation is now a thing of the past, and the new crisis is a global shortage of oil. However, neither the threat of nuclear weapons nor the pernicious moral rot of war have actually gone away in Solid Snake. And in a groundbreaking narrative twist for the time, Metal Gear 2 indirectly showed how horribly wrapped up that the two are with our civilian world's demands for commodities and resources like oil. Metal Gear 2 wrestled with the fact that wars and violence would likely remain tacitly permissible so long as they only negatively affect regions in the developing world, outside the English-speaking world, or took place in small pockets. The question the game poses is this, what would happen if one of these pocket-sized conflicts suddenly sparked a chain reaction directed against the entire world? What if a small-scale dictator, who had been allowed to survive on the margins, decided one day to take the whole world hostage? instead of playing out his given role and keeping the status quo going. These questions would form the basis for the plot of Metal Gear 2. Ironically, the game debuted in the midst of a real-world example of exactly the kind of threat that it depicted, the first Gulf War. When U.S. Ambassador to Iraq April Gillespie told dictator Saddam Hussein America had no position on Iraq's antagonisms with Kuwait, apparently she had no idea Hussein would do something as potentially disruptive to the world oil trade as invading and annexing the entire country. While a small-scale regional conflict would have been fine, a decision with such massive implications was not. All of this Metal Gear 2 foreshadowed. Solid Snake was the first in the series also to portray child soldiers and present as a major focus the rise of mercenaries and war as a new kind of business, which treats human beings as natural resources to be harnessed and commodified no differently than oil or diamonds. Next, of course, came 1998's landmark Metal Gear Solid. Many of the themes from its predecessor were revisited for a wider, worldwide audience in new and groundbreaking ways. MGS1 was actually all about de-glamorizing war. There are no heroes in war. All the heroes I know are either dead or in prison, one or the other. But Snake, you're a hero, aren't you? I'm just a man who's good at what he does, killing. There's no winning or losing for a mercenary. The only winners in war are the people. That's right, and you fight for the people. I've never fought for anyone but myself. I've got no purpose in life, no ultimate goal. Come on. It's only when I'm cheating death on the battlefield. The only time I feel truly alive. Seeing other people die makes you feel alive, huh? You love war and don't want it to stop? Is it the same with all great soldiers throughout history? I was a fool. I wanted to be a soldier. But war is ugly. There's nothing glamorous about it. More than ever, MGS1 raised the question of government deceit, showing how both soldiers and scientists are lied to and used to practice or prepare for war in the name of peace. We have to take responsibility. Science has always thrived on war. Greatest weapons of mass destruction were created by scientists who wanted to be famous. Black Project. Secret projects paid for by the Pentagon's black budget. You can avoid a lot of red tape and get a great lead time on your weapons production. And no one can bother you. Not even those bleeding heart liberals on the military oversight committee. The devs took great pains humanizing the enemy as well, having them yawn, breathe, get sick, cry out, and even bleed. Meanwhile, the very player character, Solid Snake, was subverted 
luring us in under the guise of him being some legendary hero, only for MGS1 by the end to reveal that all along we've been playing as nothing but a ruthless and inhuman murderer, a kind of Frankenstein's monster. The rich psychologies of the characters were on full display throughout the game, not merely violence with them. Ultimately, MGS1 became a dark meditation on why war may be a part of our nature, on what makes us human, and even on the meaning of life, which ultimately, the game tells us, is something we have to go out, find for ourselves, and live. Snake! What was she fighting for? What am I fighting for? What are you fighting for? If we make it through this, I'll tell you. Okay, I'll be searching too. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate, to be ruled by your genes. Humans can choose the type of life they want to live. The important thing is that you choose life and then live. one's Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty brought pacifism even further into play. While every soldier in the game was given a name and a dog tag you could collect, now players had non-lethal weapons and were encouraged to complete the game without making a single kill. MGS2 dealt with how the virtue of peace can be co-opted as advanced methods of psychological warfare, from indoctrinating soldiers via non-violent virtual reality to manipulating public opinion in so-called MOOTW, military ops other than war. As it states in the US Army Field Manual for Psychological Operations Tactics, Techniques and Procedures, PSYOP provide a non-lethal capability in conveying info to selected target audiences and governments to influence their emotions, motives, objective reasoning and behavior, to influence the will to fight and the will to obey." End quote. Like in MGS1, Sons of Liberty ends with our player character rejecting war and resolving after the game's length psychological operation against him to finally live life on his own terms. MGS2 focused much harder on the subject also of trauma. War in MGS2 is so much more than the flash of excitement violence brings. It's portrayed as not only an event, but a lifestyle. And in the life of a warrior, we learn traumas run deep. Every character in MGS2 is scarred on the inside, haunted by some loss or regret. Yet all these soldiers know is more violence. We see how generational cycles of abuse and mistakes leave their mark, surviving from one person to the next, not as genes, but as memes. I needed to know whether we were really someone else's creation. We're repeating history, Jack. Liquid and Solid hunted down Big Boss, trying to sever the tie that bound them to him. Unless you kill me and face your past, Jack, you will never escape. You'll stay in the endless loop, your own double helix. MGS1 had wondered aloud whether the world was really safer in the post-Cold War age, but it had focused mainly on questions like nuclear concealment, secretly subverting nuclear test treaties, and the invisible menace of nuclear proliferation along the black market. MGS2 was more interested in the information age, and how it was a byproduct not only of nukes but computers how the digital revolution may have rewired our minds, disguised war as peace, and diverted any genuine chance for peace or even real substantive change. 
MGS2 seems to wonder, how can real and lasting peace be possible when computers and the internet make people crazy? The only peace we see in Sons of Liberty is an illusory one, built on half-truths, and as a quasi-crypto police state. Those who try to fight for independence from the system in MGS2, all too often we see becoming that very system's pawns. When reality and simulation start to blur together, MGS2 wonders, not only how do we ever know peace, how do we really know we know anything at all? Can I ask you something? Who am I, really? I wouldn't know. But we're going to find out together, aren't we? 2004's MGS3 was even more rooted in pacifism, drawing influence again from The Great Escape. In MGS3, the enemy is emphasized as being human like us, and the major theme became how our enemies are always relative, our wars and antagonisms dictated not by inherent differences, but by the times. Politics became a living thing in MGS3, which made the topic of pacifism much more complex and interesting. Survival and escape, meanwhile, became much more important to the game than killing the enemy. They could be weakened without killing them by targeting their supply lines now. And the more violently that you behave throughout the game, the harder inadvertently became a certain boss fight, which took place down the River of the Dead, which itself subverted the rule that boss battles have to always end with killing your foe. Instead, in this instance, you had to simply figure out how to save yourself. To further incentivize non-lethal play in MGS3, each boss that you beat non-lethally also gave you useful camo with special abilities. The overall emphasis for the game was on blending in, both with the times and literally with your environment, even as both rapidly change. Is there such a thing as an absolute timeless enemy? There is no such thing and never has been. And the reason is that our enemies are human beings like us. They can only be our enemies in relative terms. 2008's Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots was by far the most dystopian game in the series. Unlike all prior entries, MGS4 went global in scale. It was thereby uniquely situated to portray things on a global stage. The game's obsession was with systems of control. In its near future, our entire planet becomes enslaved to a soulless and immortal program, the Patriots. This network of proxy AIs traps our minds and futures like flies to a web, and the brain-dead coma that results we now call peace. MGS4 demonstrated a status quo not only can arise from disorder and violence, much as Orwell with 1984 foretold, but that it arguably has. The game portrayed what we might call the substanceless, decaffeinated battlefield and global culture of the 21st century, where the logic of neoliberal hypercapitalism has devoured even war, and our notions of human rights, equality, and peace, where the average person resembles the mindless batteries powering their own oppressors in the film The Matrix, and where all of this dystopian horror comes from the system's original impetus, a peace without end. Proxies were only one small part of the vast cycle that Zero created. The corporations, for-profits, and research institutions that comprise the military-industrial complex were part of it too. They operated on budgets automatically allotted to them by the proxies. Accounts maintained by the Patriots. The network covered everything from weapons, R&D, and investment, to production and marketing. It encompassed the people, the companies, even the laws that protect them. Politics and economics became nothing more than iterations of the same oppressively uniform system. I don't think anyone realized that it was all a setup, a mere set. It was really 2010's Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker that made the subject of pacifism for the first time an explicit topic of discussion. But there are countries out there who will use force no matter how bad it looks. 
Maybe so. I know my way of thinking probably looks naive to you, but it is not like we expect peace without working for it. Diplomacy is a battle in itself, and we have to make the effort to seek out causes of misfortune and nip them in the bud. Is peace among men possible? If so, how would it work? Can any future conflict be guaranteed never to break out, perhaps via some form of automation? Can a perfect system for peace be built? Can war simply be abolished by coming to see it as another form of peace? All these philosophical questions, and more, would be raised by Peace Walker, as well as being further developed in the last true Metal Gear Solid, MGS5. In that game, the more violent and sadistically you played, the more your demon horn grew, to the point that Snake would become covered in blood that nothing could wash off. The Phantom Pain also brought the nuclear themes that had been with the series since the beginning full circle by making them interactive, as now players could build deterrence of their own, but also had to work together to disarm the world if they wanted to unlock a secret ending cutscene collectively. You'll have noticed that for a supposedly pacifistic series, each entry in Metal Gear has only seemed to question the possibility of peace further, while providing the player almost nothing except weapons and tools for violence. How can Metal Gear both seem to glorify warfare and argue for it to be abolished at the same time? After all, it's well known that these games are largely loved by people in the military. Their attention to detail, their military research, and focus on the pageantry and flashiness of guns and war all seem to contradict the idea of Metal Gear being somehow inherently pacifist. Well, here we have a great lesson on the right way to tackle that much dreaded subject of politics in games. In old interviews, series creator and director Hideo Kojima has compared his job as a game designer to creating a car. Just as many different types of drivers have many different needs, Kojima has always recognized the personal nature of games. How each player's experience will be different, how each person will both come into and away from his games with interpretations and beliefs all of their own. If you want to play these games hyperviolently, you are free to do so. But this is not a violation of Kojima's pacifism. To the contrary, it's a crucial part of it. The fun, violence, and infatuation with war and war technology that we see in Metal Gear games, I'd argue, is there to illustrate the point that war is in our very nature. War and fighting, even if only in imaginary battlefields, is part of who we are. That is what makes it seductive. That is why, if we really want to make real-world violence less prevalent, we need harmless outlets in video game form. Much of this is spelled out by Peace Walker, and its selected quote from the philosopher Immanuel Kant. The idea that war is a natural instinct or aspect to human nature for Kant does not harm the possibility of peace. Instead, it is merely the reason why peace is something to be strived for, that doesn't come naturally, that we have to work for to achieve. Metal Gear games humanize the idea of the enemy. They teach about the horrors of war, the sins of the past, and the nightmares of all possible futures. They subvert the standard expectation for military action games by giving us the option to be violent while having faith in us to one day find both the courage and the skill to get by, not only in these games, but in life, Steve McQueen style, without it. Nonviolence can be its own resistance. We can't criticize the powers that be too much if we're willing, after all, to adopt all of their same tactics. Pointing out the difficulty and danger inherent to pursuing peace isn't a rejection of it. It's necessary to ever getting the real thing. Peace has to involve pragmatic, realistic, and critical thinking. Yet it also must involve faith in human beings, a hope for building a better tomorrow, by the time our time is at its end. It is this beautiful yet cautious idealistic yet well-read and cynical dichotomy to Metal Gear games that makes the series so great and important. When I say Kojima is a pacifist, I don't mean he opposes all wars for any reason. I mean he's opposed to violence except when necessary. Moreover, I don't think Kojima is out to brainwash anyone. He doesn't make games to just tell his story, they are the tools by which we tell ours. Where we land by the end is left to us. Kojima merely poses questions and raises challenges for us to consider along the way. That's the real reason his games can be both apparently pro and anti-war. 
they all have their starting points, but ultimately they wind up an experience unique to the player. Kojima has too much respect for the medium and artistic intuition to do differently. That being said, games are always also, of course, expressions of their creator. As Kojima told Time Magazine in 2019, quote, All art, games including, is inherently political. We are living in the world. Politics is always involved. I can't create art while trying to be blind to it. I put myself out in a game. Those parts will come out. If they didn't, it would mean I didn't care about politics at all or maybe was just a weird person." End quote. In an interview with Der Spiegel Online in 2008, Hideo Kojima was directly asked, are you a pacifist? Here's what he said. That's a difficult question. I think I'm neither fully one nor the other. My personal opinion is that war should not be used as a method to solve problems. The scary thing with war is, you start one to achieve a certain goal, but then the war develops a life of its own. That's why I always have anti-war messages in my games. Then the interviewer pointed out the thing about this series that is really at the heart of this video. That in every Metal Gear Solid, as much as they deal with war and violence, it's still possible to get to the end of them, usually, without killing anyone. The interviewer then points out that this is nonetheless exceedingly difficult to pull off for the player, and then asks Kojima why. Quote, I always include it to bring to mind the avoidance of war and violence. The harder it is, the bigger the satisfaction if you make it, playing without killing. The hurdle is very high, yet if you jump over it, it's an experience the player may remember for a long time. That it was a huge accomplishment to avoid violence. That was the message I want to communicate. It's why you get better equipment, bigger rewards, a better rating in the game itself, if you can make it without killing. One story element that seemed to get retconned from this series was the complete nuclear disarmament that it Metal Gear 2 claimed followed the Cold War. This, with 1998's MGS-1, released as it was after the actual end of the Cold War, would be omitted to better reflect the real post-war era. And tomorrow, the president and his Russian counterpart are scheduled to sign the START III Accord. However, the prospect of total disarmament worldwide would return in a beautiful fashion with the player-driven disarmament experience that unlocked one of the Phantom Pain's several endings. Our duty is to pass on what we've learned to the next generation. The memories, the experiences, the sins. Only when our children show the wisdom not to forge new spears. Only then will we be truly triumphant. When asked to summarize the main idea of the Metal Gear games as shortly as possible, Kojima puts simply that, quote, things you consider as impossible around the world and in the game itself are still possible. If a player completes a Metal Gear, they're supposed to question their ideas of what is impossible. The joy, the smiling faces of people who've accomplished the impossible, that is what Metal Gear is all about. Some say a future free of nuclear weapons will never become a reality. Well, here's hoping that we, like Snake himself, can someday make the impossible possible. Until next time, boss.